Coming up today, President Park Geun-hye is in Paris for global climate change talks. She'll tell world leaders how Korea plans to slash greenhouse gas emissions over the next 15 years. Korea's rival parties reach a provisional agreement to ratify the Korea-China free trade agreement. If everything goes to plan, the deal could get the green light this afternoon. First Korea's industrial output tumbled by its biggest margin in nine months in October on the back of weak exports. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Monday, the 30th of November. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Arirang TV. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this afternoon, President Park Geun-hye is in Paris on the first leg of her trip to Europe. The South Korean leader is one of scores of world leaders in the French capital for the UN's highly anticipated conference on climate change. During her stay, President Park will lay out how Korea plans to meet its own ambitious targets. Our Hwang sang Yee filed this report from Paris. President Park arrived in Paris on Sunday to attend the UN climate change conference. She'll be received by French President François Hollande and UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon at Monday's opening ceremony. Here, President Park will address some 140 heads of state. Through her keynote speech, President Park will join international efforts for the launch of a new climate system. She will also explain Korea's efforts to counter climate change by proposing a target for emissions reductions and contribution to the Green Climate Fund. Previously, the UN-led talks focused on haggling over the developed world's targets for emissions reductions. But this year, they emphasize action by all countries. All participants submitted national climate change plans ahead of time, known as intended nationally determined contributions. Korea has set the ambitious goal of slashing greenhouse gas emissions by 37 percent by 2030. As an end product of this year's meeting, world leaders are aiming to achieve a successor treaty to the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Korea's presidential office says the global climate talks will be an opportunity for Korea to assert itself as a middle power, as it will serve as a bridge between advanced and developing nations. Hwang sang Arirang News, Paris. Now, in the lead-up to the conference, police and protesters have clashed in Paris as a few hundred people turned out for a previously planned climate march despite a blanket ban on demonstrations following the terror attacks in the French capital. Guan Zhang reports. Peaceful environmental demonstrations descended into violence as about 200 anti-capitalists and anarchists in masks became involved in a mass brawl with police. The incident occurred in the main Paris square, where tributes had been laid for the victims who died in the Paris shootings just over two weeks ago. Flowers were trampled and candles are said to have been thrown. Over 100 people were arrested and climate activists were quick to distance themselves from those involved. But for the French government, it was justification for the controversial decision to cancel the planned climate change march. This is why these protests are not authorised. We knew there would be troublemakers, who, by the way, have nothing to do with climate activists or those who want the conference to succeed and who are there only to create problems. Earlier in the day, there was little sign of what was to come. An installation of about 10,000 pairs of shoes was placed in Paris's main square in a symbolic protest to the Council Climate Change March. The shoes included those donated by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and Pope Francis. There was also another symbolic demonstration where hundreds of people linked arms to form a human chain along the route of the cancelled march. A gap in the chain was left in front of the Bataclan Concert Hall, where 89 were killed in the November 13 attacks. Elsewhere around the world, an estimated 570,000 people took part in some 2,500 demonstrations, all peacefully. The largest took place in London, where about 50,000 people marched in front of the Houses of Parliament. 
Almost a thousand people also took part in a march in Seoul, organized by Greenpeace Korea. The importance of this conference was reiterated by President Hollande and UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who held a separate meeting on Sunday before the conference. A spokesman said they agreed failure to reach an agreement was not an option and would have disastrous consequences. Kwon Jang-ho, Arirang News. Now, there's another concerning aspect of climate change and climate-related natural disasters. It's that people are becoming less worried about it, and South Korea is absolutely no exception. According to a recent survey conducted by the US-based Pew Research Center, 48% of Koreans believe climate change is a very, very serious problem, but that's actually down from 68% in 2010. Uh, an even more concerning trend was seen in Turkey with the biggest drop from 74% to 37%. And in China, where less than one-fifth of respondents said they were very concerned about the climate issue. On the other hand, the US and France saw the number of people who viewed climate change as a serious problem increase. The result of the survey was released ahead of the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris. Now in other news, following a marathon session of negotiations over the weekend, Korea's rival parties have finally agreed to ratify the Korea-China Free Trade Agreement. If ratified today, the deal will pass the Assembly some six months after the agreement was submitted for ratification. For more details, we're going to connect to our Park Ji-won, who's standing by for us at the National Assembly. So Ji-won, it has been a long time coming, but how did the, the parties finally reach a compromise? Good afternoon, Mark. The agreement on the mega trade pact became possible after both parties each made considerable concessions as give and take conditions. While the ruling Senori party has been pushing the free trade deal for the past few months, the main opposition NPAD resisted it over concerns for the nation's farming sector, who will be hard hit by the pact. The Liberal Party earlier said they wouldn't back down until a reasonable amount of compensation was available. And now the two parties finally agreed to create a fund worth about one billion U.S. dollars for farmers, as well as other measures to compensate the agricultural sector. The parties are now each holding general meetings of their assembly members, seeking their own opinions about the floor leader's tentative agreements. If no major last-minute opposition arises, the parties will hold a full assembly this afternoon to ratify the FDA. Well, that's it for now. I will have more updates in a later newscast, Mark. Thank you very much, Gion, for that report. Now, staying with domestic politics, and despite those FTA negotiations taking place, Korea's main opposition party is in the grips of an internal power struggle that's pushing it further into turmoil. The strife intensified when former New Politics Alliance for Democracy co-chairman An Chul Su refused a three-way joint leadership proposal from NPAD chairman Moon Jae-in. Now, Moon's plan would see him, An, and Seoul Mayor Park Won-soon leading the party. Instead, Anne has proposed a special national convention to elect a new leader for the troubled Liberal Party. He says such a convention would add new momentum to the party's reform efforts and help ease factional feuds. Moon says he is still deciding whether to accept Anne's proposal. Now, in economic news and Korea's overall industrial output slumped by the biggest margin in nine months in October. The drop is largely linked to sluggish exports, which are also hurting manufacturers' sentiment. Ah Hwang Jie has the details. Statistics Korea says output across all industries was down 1.3 percent in October from a month earlier. That marks the first drop in five months and the biggest decline since January this year when the figure dropped 1.9 percent. The agency attributed the slump to a drop in production in the mining and manufacturing sectors that were hit hard by slumping outbound shipments. Exports have dropped every month this year, and in October, they plunged nearly 16 percent, posting the biggest decline since the height of the global financial crisis some six years ago. Such gloomy data is directly reflected in how businesses are seeing economic conditions. The Bank of Korea says its manufacturer's business sentiment index for November came in at 68, down three points from a month earlier. A reading under 100 means pessimists outnumber optimists.
But every cloud has a silver lining. On the back of government led measures to boost domestic demand, retail sales rose 3.1% in October from the previous month, the biggest rise in nearly five years. The boosted spending also pushed up output in the service sector by 0.2%. While the finance ministry cites the slowing Chinese economy and the recent terror attacks in Paris as lingering uncertainties for the local economy, it expects the recovery momentum and spending to continue for the time being. The Korean economy grew 2.4 percent in the first three quarters of this year from a year earlier, higher than the OECD average of 2.1 percent. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Yes, and as a follow-up to that report, it turns out that the Korean economy fared relatively well in the third quarter in comparison to many other major economies around the world. According to OECD data, Korea's GDP grew 1.2% on quarter in the July to September period. This was a strong rebound from the second quarter when the Korean economy expanded a mere 0.3% compared to the previous three-month period. While the Korean economy recovered, economic growth slowed in many OECD countries in the United States. Growth slowed to 0.4 percent compared to uh, 1 percent in the previous quarter to that. Third quarter growth also slowed in Britain and other EU nations. Korea is recalling close to 5,000 cars and motorcycles from various manufacturers due to safety-related mechanical defects. The transport ministry says around 450 Hyundai Genesis coupes are being recalled because of gearbox problems. The defect can cause excessive noise and even lead to the drive axle slipping from its proper position. The affected Hyundai models were manufactured between late 2011 and April 2015. F CA Korea, which imports the Jeep Cherokee and Chrysler 200 sedans, will recall more than 2,000 cars due to problems with the air conditioning hose and main fuse boxes. Honda Korea, it's going to recall around 1,500 of its GL1800 and GL1800B motorbikes that were discovered to have defective brakes. Bentley, Porsche and Volvo are also making recalls. The ministry says owners will be notified of the recall by mail. Now, Turkey and the European Union have struck a multi-billion dollar deal aimed at allowing the, uh, rather slowing the influx of refugees into Europe in exchange for measures to encourage some 2.2 million Syrian refugees currently in Turkey to stay there. Ankara will receive financial support worth 3.2 billion US dollars. The EU also agreed to speed up visa-free travel for Turks and to renew discussions on Turkey's ascension to the regional bloc. Now, if certain conditions are met, Turkish citizens may be able to travel freely within the 26-nation uh, Schengen zone starting from October next year. Korea has been promoting smarter energy use and encouraging lower gas consumption to contribute to a more sustainable energy future. The country relies heavily on nuclear power that generates less greenhouse effect, but some experts say it's high time Korea shifted its focus to other forms of renewable energy. Sun Jung-in reports. According to the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency's World Factbook, South Korea is the world's 11th largest electricity producer, generating some 517 terawatts a year. It's also the 10th largest energy-consuming nation, using more than 480 terawatts every year. Considering Korea is the world's 13th largest economy, its energy production and consumption seem to be on par with its GDP. The figures also reveal Korea is highly dependent on nuclear power for its energy needs. Korea ranked fourth in the world for producing electricity from nuclear fuels, accounting for 27 percent of its total electricity power output. France was the most dependent on nuclear energy at nearly 50 percent, followed by Armenia and Belgium. However, Korea's electricity production from other renewable sources such as hydroelectric, geothermal and wind plants accounted for a mere 2 percent, placing Korea 82nd. As the world's major nations are leading the way toward a cleaner earth by investing in renewable energy sources, Korea seemed to be lagging behind. 
Environmental experts note that Korea's energy consumption is among the highest, despite its relatively small size and population. They say Korea has to come up with a strategy to share the production of energy using other eco-friendly options. Son Jong-in, Arirang News. Now, climate experts say an extreme El Nino, the strongest in fact in nearly 20 years, will make winter in Korea a bit milder than normal this year. But first, a cold spell will hit the peninsula next month in December, with some snow expected in coastal regions. Our Won Ji-on has the details. El Nino is an abnormal climate cycle where the Pacific Ocean heats up near the equator as trade winds weaken across the Pacific. This phenomenon can affect weather around the world and raise global temperatures. And climate experts say that's exactly what we're about to see in Korea, a warmer winter. But that's after Korea undergoes some extreme weather fluctuations next month, as cold air from the North Pole is expected to descend onto the Korean peninsula in December. Warm air from the south will flow into Korea, while cold air will descend from the north. These conflicting air movements will result in unstable climate conditions. Experts also said there may be some heavy snow along the coast. The cold snap will be over by January when the El Nino effects officially kick in to bring warmer temperatures through February. Forecasters added the precipitation will remain low in Korea this winter, meaning the severe drought will continue until next year. Won Ji-hun, Arirang News. That's all we have for now on this Monday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Thank you as always for watching. We'll be back throughout the day with more newscasts. Goodbye.